Welcome to this educational activity where Dr. Todd Levine from Phoenix Neurological Associates discusses the long-term management of patients with chronic inflammatory demyelinating polyneuropathy. The following audio is part of a certified educational activity titled Navigating the Patient Journey from CIDP Diagnosis Through Initial Treatment and Onto Long-Term Maintenance Therapy. Access the entire activity and complete the post-test at www.peerview.com forward slash BVY. Downloadable slides and practice aids are also available. Today, I will be discussing the identification and diagnosis of chronic inflammatory demyelinating polyneuropathy, or CIDP, as well as its initial treatment and longer-term maintenance therapy. CIDP is the term used for a group of disorders that are thought to be immune-mediated and by definition chronically progressive or relapsing for more than eight weeks. Although the cause of CIDP is unknown, abnormalities in both cellular and humoral immunity have been shown. Clinically, CIDP is typically defined as being a symmetric motor and sensory disorder with proximal and distal weakness and areflexia. Associated with this is conduction velocity slowing or temporal dispersion and or conduction block. Some of the atypical presentations can be a predominantly distal form, what we call DADS, or a multifocal demyelinating sensory and motor neuropathy known either as Lewis Sumner syndrome or MADSAM. In addition, there are pure motor or pure sensory forms of CIDP, and we now know that there are specific forms of CIDP associated with antibodies to contactin-1 or to neurofacin. So now I'd like to share a story about a patient. His name is Darren. He's a 40-year-old male diesel engineer specialist, been married for 14 years, and the father of two young boys. Darren is a former light smoker who's been nicotine-free for 10 years. His initial symptoms began in November of 2016 when he developed left hand weakness that was accompanied with pain and numbness while playing with his children. Darren then presented to his primary care physician in late January of 2017. His physician noticed they had weakness in the hand and diagnosed him with carpal tunnel syndrome and gave him a wrist splint but there was no change in his symptoms. He then underwent surgery for carpal tunnel syndrome in March of 2017, but again, the symptoms didn't improve. In June of that year, Darren then developed weakness in the other hand, the right hand, also associated with numbness as well as wrist and finger drop. And one month later, he returned back to his primary care physician who sent him to a neurologist for further evaluation. Darren's clinical exam with the neurologist showed normal cranial nerves, but severe bilateral median and radial neuropathies and a left ulnar mononeuropathy. He had sensory loss in all of the affected nerves, absent reflexes in his arms. His legs were normal and there were no systemic findings. Laboratory evaluation showed normal serologies, normal antibodies to neurofacin as well as contactin, and a CSF analysis was normal as well. Darren underwent nerve conduction studies, and part of those studies are shown here. And what you can see is in the median nerve with a normal velocity of 48 meters per second, he had marked slowing in both the right and the left arm with 14 meters per second on the right and 16 meters per second on the left. In addition, in the diagram, you can see very clear evidence of conduction block uh, in the median uh, and ulnar nerves, and the sensory responses were absent. There are numerous diagnostic challenges to a diagnosis of CIDP. And in 2013, an opinion article raised a cautionary challenge to neurologists to improve our diagnostic accuracy and to use objective measures to monitor treatment effect in patients with CIDP. In 2015, Allen and Lewis published a very important paper. And what they did was that they looked at a cohort of 59 patients that were referred in to a tertiary care clinic with a diagnosis of CIDP. What they found was that in reviewing the charts, half of those patients previously diagnosed with CIDP did not have any evidence from the records for that diagnosis. They found numerous alternative diagnoses, including motor neuron disease, diabetic neuropathy, 
fibromyalgia, MS, and inherited neuropathies. What was important was that in none of these patients did they have the typical presentation for CIDP. They all were felt to have atypical phenotypes. And the nerve conduction studies, which the treating physicians had interpreted as being demyelinating, often had such severe axonal loss that a conclusion about conduction velocity slowing could not be made, or the diagnosis was made based on conduction velocity slowing only at sites of compression. In addition, they found that the CSF protein was often mildly elevated and was never elevated over 100 milligrams, suggesting that treating physicians were making an important diagnostic decision based on a mild abnormality in the CSF protein. The conclusion and recommendations from this study were that patients with atypical phenotypes need very rigorous scrutiny and that clinicians should follow both clinical and electrodiagnostic guidelines in making a diagnosis of CIDP. So how about the differential diagnosis for Darren? Well, we mentioned that there were four possibilities. And if you look at just a few features of each of these diseases, you can see that it really can be relatively simple to distinguish between these diagnoses. So in ALS, the distribution of weakness typically begins asymmetrically. We know that there are no sensory symptoms and they should have increased reflexes. The disease course is usually progressive and the CSF is normal. In contrast to that, the weakness in CIDP is symmetric, both proximal and distal, and they have clear sensory signs and symptoms. Most importantly is that they have decreased reflexes, particularly in the distribution of the weakness. The disease course can be either more rapid or more slowing, but can have a relapsing pattern, which we don't see in ALS. And in CIDP, we can see marked elevations in the CSF spinal fluid protein. In multifocal motor neuropathy, the distribution of the weakness is typically asymmetric, usually begins in the arms, and there are no sensory symptoms. In addition, the reflexes can be decreased where the weakness is present, and the disease course is much more slowly progressive than ALS and the spinal fluid protein can be normal or can be mildly abnormal. And then finally in MADSAM, this is sort of the motor sensory variant of MMN, if you will. So patients are asymmetric, but they have sensory loss and they have decreased reflexes. So this is one of those atypical forms of CIDP. So this is the EFNS PNS CIDP diagnostic criteria. These first two points for the very typical forms of CIDP are really the important things to focus on when we see these patients. They have progressive, symmetric, proximal and distal motor and sensory involvement, and it exists for more than eight weeks. That eight weeks point is important because that's what makes the distinction between CIDP and Guillain-Barre. And then the second point is the decrease in reflexes. Those two clinical diagnostic criteria are gonna be the most helpful for diagnosing typical CIDP. But well, we now have clinical inclusion criteria for atypical CIDP. And this requires one of the following in addition to this typical CIDP findings. So these patients may have predominantly distal involvement, which would be DADS. They can be asymmetric, predominantly upper limb involvement, which would be MADSAM or Lewis Sumner. It can be focal, it can be pure motor, or it can be pure sensory. Now we have some exclusion criteria before you make the diagnosis of CIDP. So number one, is there any other cause that's obvious? So do they have Lyme disease? Have they been exposed to some toxin? These are rare, but worth thinking about. Probably most importantly is, is there any chance that this is a hereditary demyelinating neuropathy? And there are a number of features that might help with that, but probably most importantly is the chronicity of the disease. If they've had it for years and years, you're gonna think much more about an inherited form of demyelinating neuropathy, or obviously if there's a family history. Patients with CIDP really don't have any sphincter involvement. So if you have prominent sphincter disturbance, that should make you exclude CIDP. If there's pure motor involvement, to think of multifocal motor neuropathy, that's not CIDP. If they have an IgM paraprotein against myelin-associated glycoprotein, then that's not CIDP. And then again, other diseases such as Pohm's syndrome would be excluded as well. Now, what are the supportive criteria? When you're not 100% certain, what other things can you look to to really help make a diagnosis? Well, number one is elevated CSF proteins. 
But again, it needs to be pretty pronounced. So it needs to be over that level of 100, and there needs to be no cells. So that's very helpful. We now know that MRI of nerves can be very helpful as well. So with gadolinium, you can see enhancement of the nerve roots. You can sometimes see hypertrophy of the cauda equina, or both in the brachial or lumbosacral plexus. And what those things are telling us is that there's inflammation in those nerves. And then in addition to that, you can look at the sensory electrophysiology. And one of the things that's very helpful are patients that have a normal sural sensory response with abnormal median or radial sensory responses. And again, that's different than our typical neuropathies, which are very length dependent. This is telling you this is a non-length dependent neuropathy, and that argues for some type of immune process. And then we look at the conduction velocity of the sensory nerves, as well as the potential of looking at somatosensory evoked potentials. So if we look at these supportive criteria, the other thing to keep in mind is, if we believe that this is an immune-mediated disease, and we treat the patient with immunomodulatory therapy, do they get better? If they get better, then we feel good as physicians, and we're probably right that this is an, an immune-mediated process. Now, you need to have objective improvement. So it's not just a matter of the patient telling you they have a little more energy, their pain is a little bit better. This is really, I can walk now and I couldn't walk before, I can get up out of a chair, and I couldn't do that before either. And then the last piece, which we don't do very often, is the idea of a nerve biopsy. So sometimes, if you're not sure, we can take a nerve biopsy, and if we see clear evidence of demyelination and remyelination, then that's an argument that this is a demyelinating neuropathy. So what about the electrodiagnostic criteria for CIDP? We all know that we need nerve conduction studies to help make this diagnosis. But the point I like to make is that the clinical criteria is really the most important, and the nerve conduction studies are used as supportive criteria for this. So if the distal latency is more than 50% of the upper limit of normal, then that's probably demyelinating. If the conduction velocity is reduced by more than 30%, then that's probably demyelinating. You can look at the F waves and say, what about the F wave latencies? Are they more than 20% prolonged? Or do we have an absence of F waves in more than two nerves? And each of these criteria that you find are going to be very helpful. But they're all difficult sometimes in the setting of a lot of axonal loss. And sometimes people try to overread into them. So you really want to have a high threshold of trying to make a diagnosis of CIDP purely on the basis of nerve conduction studies if the clinical setting doesn't fit that diagnosis. When we talk about conduction block, we're looking for more than a 50% drop in amplitude to really be convinced about that conduction block. Now, why is that difficult? Well, if your distal amplitude is too small, then you're never going to see that conduction block. So it's a very helpful finding when we do see it, but it's a very hard finding to find in many patients. Temporal dispersion is really the increase in the duration of the response of the compound muscle action potential. And if that's more than 30%, then that's a very helpful finding for a diagnosis of CIDP, as well as the distal CMAP duration, which isn't used as much, but is really the same type of finding telling us that there's dispersion in the time it takes for the fastest fibers to get there compared to the time it takes for the slowest fibers to get there. So what about Darren's diagnosis? We said that there were four possibilities. Well, ALS is the first, but it's not ALS because I told you that he had a lot of sensory symptoms. So it couldn't be that. CIDP, could it be typical CIDP? No, because I told you that most of his symptoms were distal. They were following specific nerves, uh, the radial nerve, the median nerve, the ulnar nerve. That doesn't fit with the proximal and symmetric weakness that you see in typical CIDP. Could it be multifocal motor neuropathy? Again, no, because the patient had sensory symptoms. So really what we're saying is that he had a multifocal demyelinating neuropathy of the upper extremities that involved motor and sensory. And that is the definition of MADSAM or Lewis Sumner syndrome. So what are the next steps in Darren's case? Well, Darren's neurologist is gonna to talk to him about the diagnosis and is gonna review for him the different treatment options that he has. And probably the most important thing about that conversation is the idea of what are the goals of treatment? So really, when we talk about these diseases, CIDP, MADSAM, most of those goals are trying to improve a patient's strength, improve their motor performance, their quality of life, their balance. 
So it's really a motor function for most of these patients. And then what patients care about is, okay, if I get better, how long do I need to be treated? What's gonna happen to me? I'm only 40 years old. What's gonna happen for the rest of my life? These are really the important issues um, that patients face. So for CIDP, we really have three first-line therapies. One is IVIG, the second are corticosteroids, and the third is plasmapheresis. So let's talk a bit about IVIG. Um, when we talk about IVIG, there's kind of a standard loading dose, which is typically two grams per kilogram, and that can be broken up over two to five days. Um, it really depends on patient tolerance, other features about the patient, how fast or how slow you want to do that. After that initial loading dose, the standard maintenance therapy is one gram per kilogram given over one day every three weeks. Um, this can take as little as a few hours to as long as five or six hours, depending on the patient. The most important thing is to know that the infusion center that you use is comfortable with IVIG, so that if patients are elderly, if they're having adverse reactions, that they slow the rate down. Now, the potential complications of IVIG in the short run are kind of infusion reactions, so it can be rash, flushing, tachycardia, the headache, uh, aseptic meningitis that they develop afterwards, and then very rare side effects, including thromboembolic events and renal failure. So what about subcutaneous gamma globulin in CIDP? So what we know is that about two thirds of patients who are given IVIG for CIDP will require infusions for many years. And so there's a, a natural inconvenience that comes from that. They're being stuck all the time. They're stuck with an infusion nurse's schedule, an infusion center schedule. They're tied down. And so the option of subcutaneous gamma globulin, where patients can give it to themselves, is a very successful alternative route to be used for these patients. Physicians have used sub-QIG for primary immunodeficiency syndrome now for over 25 years. And one of the nice things about sub-QIG in comparison to IVIG is that the systemic side effects are much less. So in an open-label prospective study, the severity and frequency of headache and nausea were significantly reduced in patients getting sub-QIG compared with IVIG. In addition, the hemolytic anemia that can be seen in IVIG therapy can improve or disappear after switching to sub-QIG. In addition, sub-QIG is absorbed into the bloodstream over 24 to 72 hours. And so this levels out the sharp peak that you get with the IVIG, where patients get a huge bolus of it, and then it slowly tapers down over time, and where there's a concern that during that high peak, a lot of it may be cleared out of the, the system. So what we know is if you give the same total dose of IG, which you break up into four weekly sub-Q infusions, you get a near steady state concentration that's about 12 to 15% higher in the patients getting the sub-Q IG than in patients that get the IV infusions. And these differences in the pharmacokinetics probably explain the favorable systemic side effect profile of sub-QIG compared to IVIG. We now have a nice trial that looks at the use of subcutaneous gamma globulin for the maintenance treatment of patients with CIDP. The PATH trial was a randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled trial that evaluated relapse rates in patients with CIDP treated with sub-QIG versus placebo. The patients that got into the study were eligible if they were at least 18 years of age and had been diagnosed with definite or probable CIDP according to EFNS PNS 2010 criteria. And they had been on IVIG with their last IVIG treatment at least eight weeks before enrollment. In total, 172 patients were randomized to receive one of three treatment arms. One was a weekly placebo, one was a weekly low-dose sub-QIG, which was 0.2 grams per kilogram of a 20% solution, and the high-dose sub-QIG group got 0.4 grams per kilogram of a 20% solution. In the intention to treat analysis, 36 patients, or 63% of the patients on placebo, compared to 22 patients, or 39% on the low-dose sub-QIG group, or 19, which is 33% on the high-dose sub-QIG group, had a relapse or withdrawn from the study for some other reason. 
The absolute risk reductions were 25% for the group that got low-dose subcutaneous gamma globulin versus placebo, 30% risk reduction for the high-dose versus placebo, and a 6% reduction for the high-dose versus the low-dose subcutaneous gamma globulin group. Causally related adverse events occurred in 27% of the patients in the placebo group, 30% of the patients in the low-dose group, and 34% of the patients in the high-dose subcutaneous immunoglobulin group. 3% of the patients had 11 serious adverse events. One patient in the placebo group, three in the low-dose group, and two in the high-dose group. Only one serious adverse event, which was an acute allergic skin reaction in the low-dose group, was assessed to be causally related. Overall, the results of this study showed both doses of subcutaneous immunoglobulin were efficacious and well-tolerated, suggesting that subcutaneous immunoglobulin can be used as a maintenance treatment for CIDP. Now, what about corticosteroid use in CIDP? Our standard dose is somewhere between 1 and 1.5 milligrams per kilogram per day as a starting dose. The patients that receive that dose who experience substantial improvement with daily treatment can then be switched to an alternate day regimen after about two to three months, and then tapering five to 10 milligrams on the alternate day schedule every two to four weeks, depending on how the patient continues to respond. Pulse treatment with dexamethasone may serve as an alternative approach to standard daily dosing with prednisone for some patients. And because of the difficulties and side effects with corticosteroids, we tend to think that corticosteroids are best suited for younger patients with few other medical illnesses. Contraindications to long-term high-dose steroids include active peptic ulcer disease, poorly controlled diabetes or hypertension, severe osteoporosis, or the presence of some form of systemic fungal infection. Overall, the large number of potentially serious adverse events that develop after chronic exposure meeting more than two months needs to be paid very close attention to. And then lastly, it has plasma exchange. So plasma exchange is a very nice treatment uh, for CIDP. The difficulty is that it doesn't really work well long term for patients. So what we tend to see is that patients who present with exacerbations or severe relapses of their CIDP, they get admitted to the hospital. They can have five exchanges performed roughly every other day. Um, and you'll tend to see that within a week or two, uh, they do better. There are a few patients uh, that will need chronic plasmapheresis as the only alternative, the only thing that works for them. But that's really difficult because of IV access. And most of those patients do end up needing to have an AV fistula placed, which has its own set of complications. The nice thing about short-term use of plasmapheresis is really that it's well tolerated uh, and that it's safe. Uh, the downside is that you have to have a dialysis center, uh, someplace to do plasmapheresis, and you need a, a nursing uh, staff and equipment uh, to do that. Um, during uh, the treatment, patients can experience transient hypotension. Uh, because of electrolyte shifts, you sometimes will see arrhythmias, um, and some patients do get a little bit of nausea and vomiting uh, from the citrate uh, that's used in the exchange material. But overall, it, it, is, a, it is a nice treatment uh, for patients. Well, how about if patients fail those three? What's our next thing? So they don't do well with plasmapheresis, IV, IG, or corticosteroids, or maybe just not well enough, and we want to add something additional. So here it's tough, because we don't have really very good trials <laughs> uh, to tell us what to use for these patients. Um, having said that, we do use other immunomodulatory drugs uh, to try to weaken their immune system as a way of treating this uh, in conjunction sometimes with IV, IG, or with corticosteroids. So certainly there are small case reports of patients receiving cyclosporin, cyclophosphamide, methotrexate, uh, mycophenolate, azathioprine have been used. But again, there's really not very strong data. Uh, most recently, there was a trial of fingolimod, um, which was discontinued um, when the initial cohort showed no signs of efficacy. And so we're really trying to find uh, better second line or adjunctive therapies uh, that we can use in patients with uh, CIDP. So how do we decide which of these treatment options uh, we want to use in patients? So first of all, it really is a conversation you have to have with the patient. There are some patients you may talk to and they say, I'm never taking corticosteroids. <laughs> there are some patients that say, I travel too much to be 
connected to a, an infusion center. And some patients are just afraid or need to be made comfortable about their treatment choices. So it is a, a therapeutic decision-making process. It's a whole conversation that needs to happen with the patient. And we need to take into account a lot of different factors um, about the patient's circumstances, their other comorbidities, uh, how severe the disease is, how rapidly progressive the disease has been. Uh, certainly their age is an issue. Um, and really all of that needs to, to factor into what we do. And again, I always think in terms of short-term and long-term. So I tell my patients that I am never 100% certain that they have CIDP, no matter how certain I think I am, until I treat them and they're better. So that first three to six months is really A, getting your patient better, and B, convincing yourself that you made the right diagnosis. Then the second part of that is, now what's our long-term maintenance? What are we gonna do to keep treating this patient and how are we gonna do that with the least negative impact on that patient's quality of life. And so if you take those two phases into account, looking for those objective changes to make sure that we've made the right decision, you'll, you'll really end up making the best treatment selection um, for these patients. When we think about patient-centered care, what we're really trying to do is to find a common ground between the physician and the patient to achieve the best possible outcome. What that common ground has been associated with is better recovery from the patient's discomfort and concern, as well as better emotional health for the patient. It also leads to fewer diagnostic tests and referrals because of the stronger relationship between the patient and the physician. This then leads to better adherence from the patient towards their treatment regimen, and that hopefully will lead to better overall outcomes. Studies have shown that this is really important for patients, that patients want to participate in their care. They like to know about their treatment alternatives. That doesn't mean you have to go into 12 of them, but at least giving them an idea about what their options are. And they want to be involved in their decision making. And to know that if they have a problem with the first treatment that you choose, that they can come back to you and say, hey, I have a problem, and that we have other options, that they're not tied to a single therapy. Because with CIDP, we do have a number of other options. So the goals of this shared decision making is to inform the patient so that they understand their disease. We improve their knowledge about their illness. We want to activate the patient to increase the role they assume in their own illness management. And that means being aware of changes in their symptoms, being aware of side effects that they have so they come back to us and we can help them with that. And with that, we can then promote a good interaction between the patient and the healthcare professional. So when we think about the SHARE approach, the first step is number one, to seek the patient's participation, and, and knowledge and information is hugely important there. Number two, we want to help the patient explore and compare treatment options. We want to assess the patient's values. We want to allow them to express to us their preferences. If they're scared of steroids, we want to hear that. Maybe we can work with that, maybe we can't. We want to reach a decision with the patient, not, not be the one that tells the patient what to do, but to really help the patient work with them so we come to a decision together and then evaluate that patient's decision and make sure that it's at least the, the right one um, for that patient. So in Darren's case, the shared decision about treatment after a lengthy conversation with his neurologist led to the decision to start with IVIG. He felt comfortable with IVIG because the long-term risk benefit profile was better for him. And then he liked the idea that switching to sub Q might be an option for him in the future. They also agreed, again, on this timeline for looking for an objective improvement. And three months for me is really the right answer. If you give a patient IVIG and they're not any better in three months, you have to scratch your head and say, am I sure that I'm right? So getting Darren to come back at three months and asking how he's doing is hugely important. So once we establish that with Darren, he knows what to expect. He knows he's not going to get better in two days. He knows it may take a few months or longer to really see a full improvement, and he then has his expectations appropriately set, which is very important when we treat with medications like IVIG. So after that conversation, we initiated therapy with IVIG, two grams per kilogram over a three-day bolus for that initial treatment. He then continued on the IVIG maintenance at one gram per kilogram every three weeks and was monitored closely for any additional relapses or any progression of his symptoms when we made that dosing change. So in conclusion, CIDP is a term used for a group of disorders that are believed to be immune mediated. By definition, they're chronically progressive and that eight week time frame is the important time frame so we know how to distinguish CIDP from Guillain-Barre. 
CIDP could be classified into two groups. Typical CIDP has proximal and symmetric muscle weakness, sensory changes, and decreased reflexes, and slowing or temporal dispersion or conduction block on the nerve conduction studies. Atypical forms of CIDP have a different pattern, but they're still CIDP. They're still immune-mediated demyelinating neuropathies. So these can be pure sensory. They can be multifocal, uh, such as Lewis Sumner syndrome or MADSAM, um, and they can be distal, in the cases of DADS. And then in recent years, we've now found a couple of new antibodies, the Neurofacin 155 and Contactin 1, which have been identified and created two new subgroups of CIDP. Cases of CIDP can be difficult to diagnose, so we have additional supportive information. We can look for albuminocytologic dissociation in the spinal fluid, as long as we realize that we need to have significant increases in the protein levels before we take it too seriously. We can also look at MRI scans and look for enlarged or enhancing nerve roots. And then most importantly, we can look for objective evidence of response to immune treatments. But with all of these, it still presents a real challenge to diagnose many patients, particularly with atypical presentations, such as the one we saw in Darren's story. We now have three first-line therapeutic treatment options for CIDP. Corticosteroids, IVIG, or plasmapheresis, all of which have been found to be effective in a number of trials. In addition, we now have the advent of a trial that supports the use of subcutaneous immunoglobulin, adding to the treatment options for patients who need long-term maintenance therapy for their CIDP. We will have these options and we will continue the search for better second-line therapies as well. Overall though, the therapeutic decision making in CIDP is very complicated and it requires consideration of a number of factors that relate to the patient's disease course, the severity of their disease, their other underlying medical conditions, and all of these issues underscore the need for the importance of shared decision making when we make treatment decisions about treating patients with CIDP. I want to thank you for your time today. I hope this presentation has given an overview of the diagnosis of CIDP, the treatment challenges we have in CIDP, and how we can better manage our patients. This activity has been jointly provided by Medical Learning Institute Incorporated and PVI, Peerview Institute for Medical Education. Thank you for listening. Download materials and complete the post test for instant credit at www dot peerview dot com forward slash bvy this activity is supported by an educational grant from csl bearing